Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending this morning's Central Bank Listens event uh, and this webinar. Uh, my name is Ray Farley, and I'm the Head of Communications uh, here in the Central Bank, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Um, as part of these Central Bank Listening events, uh, we're holding two sessions today. Uh, the first, with yourselves, will concentrate on gathering your perspectives um, as representatives of business and of the real economy. Uh, and we'll have a further session this afternoon uh, with representatives of civil society. Um, from the outset, unfortunately, Governor McClough has been called away in the last few minutes uh, on a personal matter. So Deputy Governor Sharon Donnery will host this session uh, and she'll provide you with more context for today's event. And you'll all have received uh, the information about the event in advance. As you'll have seen from the agenda, uh, today our objective is to hear from you about your perspectives uh, on the ECB strategy review. And much of the time will be devoted to discussion and there will be plenty of opportunity to contribute to the discussion. So we would really encourage you to take as much part as possible. Uh, if you would like to contribute, uh, there are ways of doing that. Um, so please either use the chat function or the raise your hand function, uh, both of which you will see on your screen. Um, You'll get a message before it's your turn to speak, uh, advising you that you'll, we will be bringing you into the webinar. Uh, and when I call on you, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And we'll work to make sure as many of you as possible have the opportunity to contribute during the session. In terms of follow-up from this meeting, uh, we will be providing a report to the European Central Bank uh, detailing the perspectives of Irish citizens in relation to its strategy review. Uh, we will provide you with a copy of this report. Uh, we'll also be publishing a recording of this webinar on our website in due course, and we will let you know when that is also completed. So now to welcome you all to today's event and to introduce the ECB strategy review, I'd like to introduce Sharon Donnery, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank. Uh, Sharon is the Central Bank's uh, uh, she was responsibility with, uh, for central banking within the central bank and is the governor's alternate on the governing council of the European Central Bank. So I'll hand over to Sharon. So uh, good morning, everybody, um, and thanks a lot to all of you for taking the time uh, to attend this listening event, uh, which, as Ray just explained, is an opportunity for you to inform the ongoing European Central Bank's Monetary Policy Strategy Review. Um, and as he said, it's one of two events we have taking place today, this morning with you from the business community and this afternoon with representatives uh, from civil society. And now, as Ray said, unfortunately, Governor McLeod can't uh, join us, uh, but uh, it's important to emphasise that the Governor of the Central Bank, Governor McLeod, is a member of the ECB's Governing Council, which assesses economic and monetary developments and takes the monetary policy decisions, among other things. And I'm the Governor's alternate and I attend all Governing Council meetings uh, along with him. So over the last year, we've been looking at structural shifts in the euro area economy since the last strategy review was undertaken in 2003. And the global economy looked very different then. Inflation was a lot higher and central banks were more concerned about keeping it under control. So an inflation aim, which is our aim of below but close to 2%, was considered appropriate at that time. I think it's fair to say 18 years is a long time and it's now timely to look at our strategy once again. I suppose taking a step back from the day-to-day -day conduct of policy to reflect on the bigger picture allows us to ensure that our approach remains fit for purpose but also to consider some of the assumptions underlying our decision making. So, for example, how has, I think we lost the connection uh, briefly there for a moment. Uh, so I was just saying that we are looking at some of the structural uh, assumptions that underlie our decision making. Now, while many of the issues that we look at are outside the control of monetary policymakers, we do need to consider them when making our decisions. But some questions are within our power to control and are very much the subject of our current review. So what do we mean by price stability? Is our measure of inflation the right one? And are we communicating well enough? So our review will consider the current economic environment, but we also want to ensure that our new strategy remains robust to changes over time. I think it's also fair to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought some new topics more into focus, most notably the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. So while addressing all of these issues is important for society, we also need to be mindful of the extent of our mandate and the tools that we have at our disposal. In terms of scope, it's worth saying that the review will not affect current monetary policy decision making. We'll continue to monitor the evolution of the economy and inflation in the short to medium term and take decisions as and when appropriate. Now, let me just say a little bit about the Central Bank of Ireland's role within the wider euro system. 
So the euro system comprises the European Central Bank and the national central banks of those countries that have adopted the euro. The central bank represents Irish citizens in the euro system, although monetary policy decisions are made for the euro area as a whole. All the national central banks throughout the euro area are supporting this review with research, contributions and by facilitating engagement with citizens across the eurozone, such as today's events. So for today, we've structured the session into two distinct parts. First, we're going to ask you for your views on our price stability objective. We're particularly interested in finding out what it means to you and how you feel inflation affects you, your employees and your businesses. The review will consider the ECB's inflation aim and how best to measure inflation. And these listening events are a really important opportunity to understand how price changes affect people and their behaviour. We're also in this session going to explore the main economic concerns for individuals, families, communities and businesses. And we look at expectations of the economy and how the ECB can work to improve people's economic situations and their standard of living. Now, my colleague Gillian Phelan, who represents the Central Bank in the ECB Monetary Policy Committee, is going to lead that session and discussion. The second session is an opportunity for you to give us a sense of the issues you feel we could place more weight on. We want to seek your views on how well informed you feel about our monetary policy decisions and their implementation, and particularly about how our communications could be improved. And my colleague Mark Cassidy, who leads all our work in the area of economics and statistics, will lead on that session. Now, not so long ago, successful monetary policy was believed to be mainly a matter of managing overnight interest rates effectively. In the past, communication with the public was of less concern for central banks. But over time, there has been an increased appreciation of the importance of communications in delivering our aims. So we've begun to communicate more and we recognise that transparency and trust are essential elements for our monetary policy to be effective. Expectation setting requires the central bank to communicate its objective and how it intends to achieve it. And this requires in turn that the public understand the mission of central banks, recognise the importance of that mission and trust in our commitment to deliver on it. All of this requires effective central bank communication and we'd really like to hear your views on how we can do this better. A key priority for us at the central bank is to engage with the public and stakeholders across the whole economy in particular so that we can listen and learn. Better engagement helps us understand the issues faced by you in your businesses and by households in the economy and opportunities for us to enhance the performance of the financial system. In the last year, some of our more informative meetings were with the Chambers of Commerce across Ireland that we visited, albeit virtually, and the business people we have listened to. Our regular roundtables with civil society also give us important insights on the wide range of issues that we deal with, and they really demonstrate how our work touches so many facets of people's lives. For this year, 2021, a key focus of our engagement and our outreach activities will be to hear views on the impact of our monetary policy and communication and on the global challenges ahead. So let me say a special thank you to IBEC, the Small Firms Association and a number of the Chambers of Commerce that have encouraged and supported their members in attending today. We really appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much to all of you for coming today and for all my colleagues who've organised the event. And I really look forward to listening uh, to your views. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Governor Donnery. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that if you want to participate in the discussion, and we would really encourage everybody to do so, uh, to please use the chat function on the bottom of the screen um, or to raise a hand. And when we get to the discussion part of the session, uh, we will start calling people in um, and we'll give you some notification before we do so. So I'm now going to uh, introduce my colleague, Gillian Phelan, uh, who will introduce the first discussion session of the morning. Gillian is the Central Bank's Head of Monetary Policy and I'll hand over to you, Gillian. Uh, lovely. Thank, thanks very much, Ray. Uh, and good morning, everyone. And, and just to echo, uh, you know, our thanks to all of you being here this morning. We, we really do appreciate you taking the time uh, to come and talk to us about this uh, quite important topic for us this year. Um, so uh, uh, as Deputy Governor Donnery mentioned in this first session today, we'll focus on price stability. Uh, so to provide some context for what we mean by price stability, I should note that this is the primary mandate that's been given to the ECB under the treaties of the EU. So while the EU treaties clearly establish price stability as the primary objective of the ECB, it doesn't really give a precise definition as to what this actually entails. So it's up to the ECB to define what is meant by price stability and design its own strategy to achieve it. 
So as, as, as was highlighted in, in Deputy uh, Governor Donnery's remarks, uh, the last draft review was undertaken uh, by the ECB Governing Council back in 2003. So I think that's almost 17 years ago when they decided to aim for inflation rate of below but close to 2% over the medium term in order to maintain price stability. However, at that time, central banks around the world were more concerned with inflation rising too quickly. So the experiences of the 1970s and 80s, where inflation rates were regularly at double digit levels, uh, led central banks to actively combat increases in the prices of goods through the economy. So this is where the concept of our inflation aim stems from, and it's something that's pursued by, pursued by central banks across the globe. However, in recent years, we've been a lot more concerned about how low and negative inflation rates uh, are impacting. Uh, there has been a notable shift in the direction of risk to inflation, with inflation moving below the ECB's aim for regular and extended periods of time. So this brings its own problems with the threat of deflation coming into focus. So deflation is when the prices of goods and services decline, and this can cause serious problems for the economy. Um, for example, if customers believe that the price of a good will decline in the future, they will hold off on purchasing a good. So that will mean that the business uh, base reduced demand for their goods and services, and this may lead to job losses as a result. We would like to know if you have concerns about deflation uh, or high inflation. Is this something that impacts your organize, uh, organizations and your decision making? And is this something um, that is thought about? Um, the definition of the ECB's inflation target, that is keeping inflation below but close to 2%, doesn't mean that inflation has to be, you know, precisely at this level all the time. I mean, that would be that would be impossible because economies are kind of dynamic and, and open to, to many influences. For instance, a drought could lead to a, a bad harvest. Uh, some food prices may rise as a result of, uh, of reduced supply and with them then inflation, but only temporarily. So the ECB, it doesn't have to react to all these temporary movements in prices. Then. It needs to identify which changes in the economy are here to stay and, and which are not. And that's why the ECB aims to steer inflation over, over what we call the medium term. So we define our target as being inflation of below but close to 2%. So that definition of inflation is important. At the moment, we use um, overall HICP, which measures a basket of goods that is harmonized across all euro area countries. However, whether this basket reflects how people perceive changes in the price of goods and services in daily life is very, very important. And part of the reason we're hosting a listening event such as this today. The cost of owning a home um, is, is, um, is currently not reflected in the measures of inflation, and this is one issue that's been raised. Um, and we know too well in Ireland, house prices have risen quite notably in recent years, while inflation has stayed quite low. So on the other hand, buying a house is often a long-term investment, and, and therefore it doesn't really fit with the, the prices of things that we buy from day to day. So we'd like to get your views on whether and how the cost of housing impacts on the perceived cost of living. Then we'll move on to the second part of this session, and this will focus on your economic expectations and concerns. So one of the main reasons uh, the mandate of the ECB is price stability is because it helps to promote a healthy economy. So stable uh, prices help to grow. When the prices are stable, they help people and businesses plan their spending and investment, and this creates jobs and prosperity. There have been some notable structural changes in the economy in recent years, and in particular since the global financial crisis. For example, since the financial crisis, people prefer to invest in safe assets, for example, in government bonds, rather than the risky ones. There have been changes in, in ch uh, demographic changes over time that have had an impact on the function of the economy. For example, people are living longer, they're saving more so that we can live more comfortably in our retirement. As a result of the, these examples, the economies are no longer growing at the, at the race, rate that they once did, which makes businesses less optimistic about the future, and ultimately then they invest less. So these developments, as well as others, have, have changed how our economy works. And they've led to a fall in the so-called natural rate of interest. And this is the interest rate at which the economy runs smoothly and where prices are stable. Traditionally, interest rates have been the main tool used by central banks to influence the economy. If a central bank um, increased their interest rates above the natural rate, it, um, it restrains growth and the economy and, and inflation tends to fall. But if central banks reduce their interest rate below the natural rate, the opposite happens. So because the natural rate has declined, central banks have been forced to put interest rates also, and they're likely to remain low for some time into the future. Another example of the issues faced in the years following the financial crisis is the friction in the banking system, which affected monetary pol pol policy transmission to the real economy. For example, when the ECB lowered its interest rates to make loans cheaper for businesses and people, the extent and speed of interest rate changes often varied across banks. So this can mute the effects of monetary policy changes and therefore impacts on the ECB's ability to steer inflation. 
So overall, I've, I've highlighted just some of the changes in the euro area economy in recent years. Um, it is important to take account of these changes and, and more importantly, how people feel they have been impacted by such changes. So to make our monetary policy as effective as possible, we want to understand your expectations as well as your economic concerns. How have your organizations or circumstances changed? How has COVID-19 um, had an impact? Um, what's your expectations for the economy going forward? And it would really be great to hear your views on, on any or, or all of these questions. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Gillian. That's great. Thank you, Gillian. So as I mentioned at the outset, if you want to engage with uh, the chat uh, or if you want to come in on any of the items that have been raised in that opening section, if I could ask you please uh, to use the chat functionality at the bottom of the screen or to raise your hand and we will queue people in uh, in turn if that's okay. So um, I have a couple of speakers who have already uh, indicated their willingness to come in. So uh, firstly, can I ask uh, Danny McCoy, uh, the Chief Executive of IBEC uh, to come in, please, Danny, if you could uh, unmute and turn on your camera, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, and thanks, Sharon and Gillian, as well, for uh, for the brief at the start. So um, I'm going to attempt to try to forget my economics hat for a moment here and um, try to reflect both IBEC as a business itself and the CEO of IBEC, just some observations on what it means to our business. The analogy I would use here is like standing on a bouncy castle. Um, you know, it's it's much more pleasant when it's going up gently, um, as opposed to going up violently. So you like the gentle rise, um, but you can cope with a gentle deflation as well, as long as it's not too extreme, because going down will uh, allow you to say, right, we got need to do something here for the business. So I'm talking about looking at our P&L and our balance sheet, and basically the buoyancy here. Um, and so small movements aren't really that disconcerting, but obviously it's much more pleasurable uh, for budgeting and even just for the psychology of the management teams and the employees if there's a modest amount of inflation in that kind of bouncy castle analogy I'm giving here. So I think that's how businesses actually feel about inflation. The other thing that strikes me is... Um, we're dealing with the price obviously here. And of course, for, for many businesses, it's the price and quantity. You know, people live in turnover world. I know economists are always quoting the real growth rate, but actually for most businesses, what matters is the price and the quantity. It's, it's a kind of a turnover uh, basis on which they're operating. So again, depends on the nature of their business and what's happening on the quantity side, whether they're gonna be discommoded by by small disinflations uh, or small inflations is as much what's happening, their overall mix, the sensitivity, I suppose, to price movements for their business and quantity. And I think that that feels a little bit absent for business people when there's a, a very singular focus from this econ economist analytical framework, which looks at the separation of the real activity and then the prices over here it's a combined it's a combined problem for businesses so meandering a little bit there on the first part i think that that analogy is that people can cope with small changes up or down the other thing i suppose to get across um is you know to the lay person i would have thought that price stability is pretty obviously zero inflation precisely right so where is this two percent um kind of gap uh, argument there in, in lay terms. And that, I suppose, in terms of buoyancy in a business, looks at some of the margin you can give for what you might describe as productivity um, and the expectations that people will always like to see their wages and return going upwards rather than have to adjust expectations downwards. So that prism of the zero to two percent feels like the right zone to me just from a business perspective um, to allow businesses have that feel of some buoyancy. So in sum, uh, the, you know, my, my analogy is all about buoyancy, uh, better up than down, but the speed at which the bouncy castle goes up can be disconcerting uh, in either direction. Um, so we don't like too much inflation and it distorts, it, it distorts just the sense in a business of how to plan. Last thing to say, maybe just a more contemporary point, 
than uh, the necessary the long term framework here is with negative interest rates and having produced so much money uh, in the quantitative easing there's a there's a lot of sense of passing the parcel going on right now lots of businesses are actually quite cash rich um, and so they're getting this they're they're getting distorted in their decision making in terms of how to pass the money um, quickly to get them off their balance sheets um, at various points in time, at least it's going to be costly to keep that cash. That's a wasted effort, right? That's really just passing a parcel and not allowing people to focus in on that, which should be their primary role in whatever product or service they're delivering. So disinflation um, or deflation uh, and negative interest rates is a really bad space for productivity actually of management teams as well, because you get obsessed by not holding ending up holding too much cash. So it seems like a perverse world uh, to say that, but for lots of businesses, that's that's definitely a phenomenon at the moment come year end, not to be stuck with too much cash on your balance sheet. Thanks, Ray, I'll hand back to you. That's great, Danny, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, Sven spollen Behrens from the SFA uh, who has also uh, come in to speak. I just remind everybody, if you'd like to uh, join the conversation, please use the chat functionality at the bottom of the screen uh, or raise your hand and we can queue you in. Um, so Sven, um, if you'd like to come in, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ray. And uh, before I start, first of all, a big thank you to uh, the Central Bank for organizing the event this morning, but also a big thank you to the Central Bank for your level of engagement with us, the Small Firms Association, um, throughout 2020, which was uh, obviously a very difficult year for all of us. A particular thanks to, to Sonia Felton and her team. And then um, at Sibley, um, we had good engagement last year in relation to SME access to finance. And we did just a great bit of work there together. Um, let me start off by quoting a tweet uh, uh, from the E, which was uh, posted on uh, of February. Uh, Roses are red, violets are blue. We'll keep financing conditions favorable to rises is true. So this is something for me as a former economist being uh, taught by uh, a monetarist and uh, Milton Friedman was uh, uh, one of his, his idols. So, so this is a paradigm change and this has served us well, uh, obviously through uh, uh, the months of crisis. Uh, so, so, so that's, that's uh, really interesting to see. And also I didn't know until recently that the ECB had a, a Twitter account. So that's also, that's also good to know. But um, the, the situation as we, as we see it here from a small firm's perspective, Lee, Medium term, um, small businesses are, in Ireland are well well positioned. Uh, we, we talk about uh, productivity. We talk about uh, uh, finding people with right skills. Uh, but short term, the situation of the small business community is characterized obviously by uncertainty and anxiety, um, probably particularly depending on uh, what part of the economy uh, you're in. It was encouraging to see there's a number of small businesses that have done well over the last 12 months as some small businesses have grown, but there are others uh, that are not doing um, so well. And, and obviously for those of the next few months and support from government uh, and uh, being able to um, get, get the funding into the market is going to be uh, of key importance. Uh, in relation to um, price stability, uh, also short term, we see that there is deflation in certain um, parts of the market. If I look Look at some of the businesses that are particularly impacted by lockdown, uh, which are the um, the non so-called non-essential retailers. And if I'm correct, the, the retail price index uh, in January was was again um, negative. So you have short-term um, deflation there. So we need to keep an eye on things, uh, but also obviously um, stability and um, the overcoming uh, uncertainty and anxiety. Price stability is going to be. Uh, of, of real importance to, to the small business community, uh, in particular in light of, uh, and I don't think there's an index for that yet, the cost of doing business in Ireland um, um, index, uh, where, where new measures are being introduced that are going to have a negative impact on the cost side uh, for small businesses. So in light of that, 
it's really important uh, to have the stability in, in, in terms of uh, uh, in inflation and, and hopefully um, all of uh, the negative interest rates are not coming back to bite us in three or four years time. But, but overall, um, there's cautious um, optimism and, and with the roses and violets, there's obviously signs, signs of spring, but uh, we really still do need the support of the central bank and we really appreciate it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you, Sven. Um, I might ask my colleague uh, Gillian Phelan just to come back in maybe on some of those points uh, and also encourage anybody else who is part of the webinar um, to get involved in the conversation, please. Um, so Gillian, I might maybe hand over to you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ray. And just to say thank, thanks a million. Your your insights are, 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 are really, really great. And we're going to do our best today not to uh, you know, uh, not to answer too many questions because we really want we really want to hear hear your views. But we we've gotten a nice view there in terms of uh, views from IBAC and the SMEs. I wonder. Uh, I know we have some other kind of retailers on the call. Maybe maybe they could give us some of their views as well, and um, maybe uh, some of the you know Chamber of Commerce people are here as well. Maybe like there's a more regional view might be interesting as well. We we'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah. So thanks thanks Ray. Thanks, Julian. Um, Simon Barry um, has put up his hand. So, Simon, can I ask you maybe to unmute and turn on your camera, please? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ray, and thanks to everybody in the bank for um, for reaching out. It's very useful and, and worthy and worthwhile exercise. Um, I, I was just going to maybe offer some observations briefly on on the um, on the specification of the inflation aim, um, and in particular the formulation of it in terms of being below but close to 2%. Um, and I guess my observation is that that is perhaps a little bit more ambiguous than it could be or than it might be. Um, and at times over the last number of years, it has felt as if there has been maybe a lack of clarity and perhaps even a lack of, of full complete agreement within the governing council as to what exactly um, is being sought by way of um, an inflation rate over the medium term. Um, and, and so my observation would be that I think as part of the review, whatever metric of inflation um, uh, the review lands on, uh, that I think there could be scope to arrive at a, a, a cleaner um, and clearer characterization of the inflation rate which is deemed to be consistent with the, the, the overall objective. And as, as people on the on, on the line will perhaps be aware, many other major central banks have, have, a, have a straight, direct, clean characterization of, of a, a desire to reach inflation of 2% over the medium term. Um, and, and perhaps that's something that could be considered. Also, just in, in relation to um, the, the, the time horizon over which policy um, is seeking to achieve the aim, um, and there is an issue which has arisen over the last couple of years, whereby if, if one looks at the um, the staff macroeconomic projections produced by Eurosystem and ECB staff, over the last two years, um, the average endpoint forecast, in other words, the very end of the inflation projection, um, the average endpoint over the last eight um, sets of projections is one and a half percent. Um, and that raises the question, well, is, is that deemed to be a satisfactory inflation rate and consistent with below but close to 2% or, or not? Um, that does seem to have changed. Um, um, and it, it begs a number of questions, um, uh, including whether 1.5% is deemed to be consistent with the inflation aim. Or, or secondly, if, if, it, if, it, if it's not, um, is it the case that the time horizon over which the Governing Council is seeking to bring inflation back towards its aim is perhaps longer than has been captured by the, the staff projections? In which case, I think there's a case in the interest of transparency and, and uh, improved uh, maybe communication flow to, to make that explicitly clear, as has been the case again in the case of other peer banks, including the Bank of England, which traditionally has a, an 18 to 24 month time horizon, but in exceptional circumstances, it can and has explicitly opted uh, to shift its time horizon out closer to, to two to three years in, um, when circumstances warrant. And if that's the case um, within the Governing Council, I think it, it, there, there's scope maybe to improve the explicit communication around that. Um, or of course, it, it also begs the question, well, um, it, is, it, is it not the case that policy could perhaps and, and should not perhaps have been more accommodative if um, at the end of the staff's projection inflation is only 
uh, arriving at a one and a half percent um, endpoint. Um, they were the comments I wanted to make. Great, thanks. That's great, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go next to Graeme Byrne, who's the CEO of Flender and also the president of the Small Firms Association. Uh, Graeme, can I ask you to come in, please? Uh, hi, Ray. Thank you. Can you see me and hear me? Can indeed. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks for the promotion as well. I'm actually the chairman uh, as opposed to the president of the Small Firms Association, but uh, I'll take either title. Um, um, I, I just, and, and I don't want this to be a, an SFA IBEC takeover either, but um, there is a couple of uh, um, um, news that I'd like to, to, uh, to make known, um, certainly from um, the environment, from a, a banking point of view, and, and Sven had talked about the, the cost of, of doing business now and the increase in, and the, the concerns around the cost of doing businesses for, 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 for the SME space. Um, but there's also a huge um, uh, elephant in the room, which is the cost and loss of loss of opportunity for SMEs going forward based on, on our potential recovery path as well. Um, and the concern really is around uh, the huge contraction in, in the sort of banking market and financial services supply market with regards to um, you know, a lot of the pillar banks had to exit post post credit crisis, which have never not been replaced. Uh, there was also a shrinking of the non banking market, um, albeit that's probably stabilised a little bit more now. But certainly now, obviously, with the announcement of of, of uh, one of the other major SME banking players, uh, Ulster Bank, potentially leaving and exiting the market, that that even contracts it even more. And you know. Um, it, the question really is, is that, you know, is the system fit for purpose with regards to supporting an effective um, um, uh, reboot in the economy? And is it fit for purpose in the supply of, of the appropriate products and, and um, appropriate capital that, that SMEs need in order to uh, take the opportunities that the bounce back or just opportunities as business as usual? Um, I mean, it's an incredibly challenging uh, space for them to be because, as you can imagine, with the mass contraction uh, within the space, a lot of the major pillar banks will will contract even further, as in they will ring fence their own customer base and look after that without obviously giving any priority to, um, you know, sort of a, a, a their new business clients or new business onboarding. So that makes it very, very challenging. Um, the other concern that kind of nearly follows on from that as well is, is that, uh, one of the major discussion topics within that um, SME uh, base, uh, the voice really is coming back about really how, um, you know, given this is such an exceptional period uh, and it's such an exceptional event, um, the whole viability and credit viability assessment piece uh, for, for, for small business and SMEs is incredibly challenging. It's pushing them beyond the limits uh, because Obviously, in order to facilitate accuracy around viability, there needs to be a huge amount of investment from SMEs into the financial and financial control structures of their business, which is not an easy thing to do, and certainly not an easy thing to do overnight. Uh, and trust me, um, you know, um, good uh, CFOs and financial controllers are hard to come by. Um, so really, it's, it's more just to understand exactly you know how in, how much of influence the central bank can have, both on you know the attraction of of, of appropriate capital coming from bank and non bank uh, to supply the SME space, and also you know how they can assist with regards to um, the understanding of credit viability with the with the um, with with the uh, hopefully with the pandemic and its wing mirror, but understanding exactly where the credit viability is from. From um, from an SME point of view, that uh, emanates itself not just into um, their credit or appropriate credit going forward, but also how they're dealing with suppliers and preferential creditors, um, and being able to um, to um, to manage that, and then obviously be able to match the growth that potentially comes from a, a, an economic an economic reboot. So thanks uh, uh, for that. That's my comment. 
That was great, Graeme. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have representatives on the call from uh, the IFA, uh, from the Construction Industry Federation um, and from Chambers of Commerce. And I know we have a, a, a lot of representatives on the call as well um, from different businesses. Um, so I would like to ask you guys to uh, to maybe take part in the conversation if you can. Um, Gillian, um, I'm not sure, do you want to maybe just respond maybe to some of the comments that you've heard there in the last minute or two? Apologies, uh, that mute button's given me difficulties. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, it's so so nice to hear all of the views from such broad business perspective, and I mean, we're we're very much here, kind of in listening mode. But it's it, it's lovely. I mean, uh, even even Danny Danny McCoy's bouncy cast analogy. I mean, I mean, I think I think you're exactly right, and and I and I really like it. I mean, it, it it's the price stability aspect that we're we're interested in, and 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 in ways that is what's important. And but I guess there is, and also. Um, you know, it's the absolute level, I guess, also has an element there, too. And this is where this discussion around 2%, I mean, you know, some people would say, well, maybe maybe inflation should be 4%. If the ECB had an inflation target of 4%, then, you know, they you, you, that would be the target. And, you know, uh, inflation expectations would lift to meet that. And other people say, well, why is 2% a good inflation target? Surely no rising prices from a consumer perspective is something. But I think what most central banks have kind of Come to the kind of agreement, and, and, and a few of the speakers have picked up on it there. I mean, two percent is probably looks about right, um, but it depends. We have to take account of the context in terms of what's happening in, in the macro environment and so on and so forth. But um, I think, I mean, you're you're raising a lot of the key issues that are being discussed uh, quite a lot in terms of the, the ECB strategy review. So, so thank, thanks very much for all of that. Um, That's great, Julian. Thank you. Um, and, and just to reiterate, one of the questions is the economic concerns that people are facing. So um, I think we have a, a, a large number of people on the call who are in well positioned to be able to, to add to that conversation. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Edouard Galicier um, from Aviva to come in. Um, Edward is the, the CFO of Aviva. Um, Edward, can you come in with your comments, please? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much um, for, for um, this discussion. Um, I think what I, I wanted to comment on is um, less the target and more the means to get to the target um, and specifically the large asset purchase. Um, I think um, the question that we always have myself is that what could be the unintended consequences of these asset purchase and the, and the free money effectively. So free money flowing to small businesses um, or, or larger businesses is, is very healthy. Um, if the money flows and, and creates asset bubbles, whether it's real estate or whether it's a, it's a wall of money going into equity uh, or, um, or, or, credit, um, or, or credit credit quality that is lowering, um, that could uh, bring negative consequences in the, in the longer term. Um, I think we, we're all aware of, of where the equity market is going and that's probably partially driven by the amount of free money going into that. Um, so what's the impact on, on businesses and what's the impact on society from that free money is, um, I think, a, a, a major question for me. Then if I speak specifically about financial services um, and insurance, but, uh, but uh, I probably think that my banking colleagues would think the same, um, is the, the, uh, the, the, the lower rates um, that we can, can be gain on investment portfolio, which backs all our reserves, means that we have to move our asset allocation and seek higher yields into uh, more um, illiquid assets, alternative investments, um, or longer term credits or, or, or lower credit quality, which um, is difficult. Uh, and um, th this question as to whether firms will do it. If they don't, then that means that they have to earn the margin in their in their core business to investments so that's pricing impact on all the customers and if they do if they do seek longer term credit or a liquid do they have the ability to manage these properly and if something happens there could you have uh, a consequences on, on on the balance sheets um, of these entities and um, so i think that that's that's really the question i had on on the uh again not the target itself but more the means to get to the target and the and the almost free money um, that's resulting from that. Thank you. 
That's great, Edward. Thank you. Um, I think just to, I suppose, uh, go back on the, the, the two parts of the discussion um, or the two topics for discussion in, in, in this piece. Uh, and the second part, um, I think we've we've dealt with some of it, but I think there are probably more insights to be gained around um, what are your economic expectations and concerns. Um, and I think given some of the uh, the people on the call, I think we'd like to hear from them on uh, those th that particular subject uh, if, if they were able to come in. Ger Brady, um, could I maybe ask you to come in um, on the second topic uh, around the uh, the issue that we discussed there, which is the economic expectations and concerns. Uh, if you could uh, if you could come in, please. Yeah, so, so I suppose in terms of economic expectations, I think the big challenge we've seen from members across almost every sector in the last number of months, and particularly now actually, is this uncertainty about when things return to normal. Um, so, so it's outside the return of, or, or the purview of, of central banks, I suppose, but that kind of guidance and the importance of forward guidance from central banks in terms of credit conditions, in terms of policy, is really important at the moment where we talk to CFOs and, and finance teams about their expectations for the coming year. Um, and they're really waiting to see what happens in the external environment to, to kind of set the deadlines and, and, and make those changes, uh, particularly in vaccine rollout, the path of the virus and everything else. Um, so the certainty provided by the central bank and its role there in communicating that certainty about both policy and, and fund, the funding environment is, is very, very important. Uh, during that period. Uh, in the kind of medium term, I suppose most people, my sense is, still have optimism and hope that coming out of, of this crisis, we're going to see, um, even though people's balance sheets will be slightly impaired, um, that the scale of fiscal support and, and monetary support has been enough that many of them will come back after this crisis and, and start to grow again at a quicker rate, I suppose, than the last crisis. The big challenge for a lot of companies from a monetary policy point of view is this playoff between where uh, the, the price inflation might start to come back into the economy, um, particularly because of Brexit, because of increasing costs, because of continued tightness in the labour market outside the sectors worst hit by COVID, um, and the, the financing needs and impaired balance sheets that they have. And there is going to be a, a trade-off there. So that kind of uh, medium term view of the 2% the, the target uh, that the ECB has allied with all the structural changes that we're seeing in the economy and the kind of timing of, of when we'll start to see interest rates move upward again is something that lots and lots of people are looking at. And then on the other side, the, the ECB obviously also has a role uh, in, in government uh, borrowing costs uh, through its, its uh, purchasing programs and QE. It, it impacts on that market too. And I think a lot of people are looking at that because it will impact on when governments make fiscal policy decisions uh, to, to start to maybe tighten policy again, uh, which will directly impact on companies too. So, so I think from a, from a business point of view in the short term, there's a huge amount of uncertainty that people are trying to work through. And, and the central bank is giving certainty there in the short run about interest rates in the medium term there's a kind of a foot race between the costs that we're seeing and the cost pressures coming into the economy on one side and this question about the the path of interest rates on the other side and, and over the last decade as 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 simon and others have said that there has been a huge amount of 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 misfires i suppose from everybody across including ourselves and everybody else in, in terms of that expectation for when inflation will come back so what does the new inflation environment look like? What's the central bank's role in that environment and, and how long does it last is, is a big questions for, for everybody. That's great, Ger. Thanks a billion. Um, can I maybe go to my colleague, um, Sarah Holton, to um, I suppose give a, a reaction to some of the uh, the inputs that we have just heard, uh, and also we're uh, we've got about ten minutes of this conversation left. So if you do want to uh, take part in the conversation, if you want to get involved and engaged, um, as I said, please use the chat functionality and raise your hand, and we will bring you into uh, the conversation. Um, Sarah, I might maybe hand over to you. 
Thanks a lot, Ray. Yeah, and just uh, thanks also from my side for um, all of the contributions. They've been super interesting for us and, and very important for us in the review. Um, so I'd just like to kind of maybe pick up on a, a few points that kind of came up in the contributions to hear a bit more, because I know we have, we're very lucky to have um, a very broad spectrum of people, retailers on the line and different businesses. So to pick up a little bit on what Danny McCoy was speaking about and, and negative interest rates, um, could we get like a, a feeling from people of the balance between, say, that problem of cash management versus maybe credit development? So we also heard, you know, about kind of access to finance for SMEs. So how people feel the balance of, of those messages is, is coming out um, from the ECB and how the interest rate in, environment on balance is affecting them. And then also, um, I think Jared kind of mentioned it there um, on the on the last on the last point was um, the labour market. So he, he mentioned that there are some sectors of the labour market that are tight. So it'd be interesting to get, you know, businesses' views on that, Chambers of Commerce's views on that, has it changed? And also on a, on a point that we haven't um, heard from yet that we're, we're very interested in is whether you have views on, on the measurement of inflation. So um, as Gillian mentioned at the outset, um, how we measure inflation obviously um, has a big effect on, on, on the decisions we make and all of that. Do any does anyone on the call have feelings that the the measure that we have is a good representation? Um, at the moment, for instance, we don't capture cost of housing in in the measure, and of course, being from Ireland or Dublin in particular, I think everybody's aware that that's a you know a, a very kind of um, current pressure. So it would be great um, to kind of broaden the the conversation a bit to some of these um, topics. If anybody um, has views on these, or, or of course any any of the other areas. Um, we'd really appreciate them. Thank you. Great. Sorry, just on um, uh, Sarah's point there, I suppose what, one trend, again, where it comes up on the wage expectations aspect is whether the European Central Bank needs to take account of the wave that's developing towards the idea of a living wage mm -hmm. and bringing in those other factors, because traditionally on the productivity argument, um, the comfort in business was zero to two percent was reflective of the embedded productivity in the consumer basket that was being measured. Whereas, if a living wage is to come into the um, true legislation or whatever into the thinking, then there may be a mismatch potentially between what the inflation rate is saying and what a measure like a living wage might might bring forth. Um, on the competitors' argument, I'll, I'll leave that to others. Um, where the Ireland at the moment is kind of superly competitive by the capital stock change, um, which is given difficulty in the in the attribution of labour productivity, given the sheer scale of the the capital movement that we experienced the last number of years. That measure is probably way out of kilter. Um, but anyway, that's that, <laughs> that's a slightly different issue. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Okay, um, we are going to wrap this session um, now, and I might ask um, Gillian Phelan to come back in um, to reflect on the session and, and some of the key messages that came out. And following that, we will move on to uh, the next section of the session. So Gillian, I'll hand over to you. Okay, super. Uh, thanks, Ray. I mean, just to say um, thanks a million um, for the, the broad range of views, and um, we very, very much appreciate it. I mean, it, it's nice to get such a broad uh, business perspective. I mean, there's a lot of key issues that you've raised there. <clears throat> I mean, the the two percent target. I mean, that that that's certainly on the table. And and I mean, it, it's it's nearly, I mean, the obvious place to start in terms of a discussion around uh, the ECB strategy because this this is this is the inflation aim. And there's been a lot of discussion around that in terms of the Fed review and you know what the ECB will do. There there's the kind of all eyes are on the ECB in terms of decisions around that as well. But I mean, I think we've articulated around the two percent a little bit and. You know why many central banks have landed on that, and and even after the strategy review, they've um they've kind of stuck close to that. But I certainly take the point that you know some kind of certainty around that target would be would be very very useful as well. Um, I, I also think uh, the the idea around momentum around inflation and deflation is 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 a very nice perspective and it's an interesting way of looking at things. So I'll thank Danny again for his his bouncy castle uh, metaphor. Um. I, another key issue uh, that came up as well, which, which I mean, it, 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 it's everywhere at the moment, is this idea of low for long and how low, how long are our are, are interest rates going to be low? I mean, 
in terms of decision making. This feeds into the idea of uncertainty that was raised as well. So very, very important. And someone else also mentioned the cost pressures and, and the path of interest rates. Of course, these are all kind of in, inextricably entwined. And, and, and that will be, I mean, and it also depends on the recovery from COVID-19 and, 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 you know, what so-called normal uh, looks like. Because I guess in terms of um, the economic and the macroeconomic outlook, really, we're been, it's been driven by the virus right now. So, I mean, what the medium term will look like after that will be will be interesting to see, too. Um, and I mean, this notion, what will, like, I mean, some people think inflation could come back really quick after 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 the pandemic has, has, has passed. I mean, I think more people would, would be more concerned about deflation. But I mean, there are those concerns around inflation as well in terms of supply issues and so on. And I also like the idea of the living wage. I mean, there is there is a there's a lot more discussion about, you know, the and, and Sarah mentioned it there, you know, should we include owner occupied housing in, in our measure of inflation? Is the HICP really capturing what people, you know, feel in their day to day um, lives in terms of, of, of inflation? So are we measuring what what people see as inflation in their daily lives? And, and that's that's another very, very key issue. So the living wage idea would, 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 would come in there as well. So on that, I, I think I think I'll leave it there, Ray, and I, and I very much look forward to the next session. So thank thank you all, thank you all very much. Again. That's great, thank you, Gillian. And again, thank you everybody for uh, for engaging in that conversation. And um, same rules apply as we move into the next section, which is if you want to become uh, part of the conversation, um, please use the uh, the chat box at the bottom of the screen and raise your hand, uh, and, and we can bring you into uh, into the conversation. Um, so I'm now delighted to introduce my colleague um, Mark Cassidy, who will introduce our second session for this morning. Um, Mark, as many of you will know, is the director of economics and statistics here in the bank. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Ray, and um, a good morning, everybody. Let me also thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I found it a very interesting first session. This session's second session, we will cover two items. First, what we have imaginatively called other topics, and then secondly, how we communicate with you. So in the first part of the session, we would like to hear about other issues that matter to you. Gillian highlighted in the first session that the ECB's primary objective, it is price stability, but while that takes precedence in monetary policy implementation, there are other objectives that can be supported by the ECB, and some of those issues were already touched upon in the first session. So, more specifically, the EC or the EU treaties say that without prejudice to the objective of price stability, the euro system shall also support the general economic policies in the EU with a view to contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the Union. And those objectives include issues such as full employment and balanced economic growth, among others. Incidentally, the ECB, with its primary mandate for price stability, that differs from some other central banks, most notably perhaps the US Federal Reserve, which in fact has a dual mandate of price stability and full employment. And while the EU treaty does not allow us to change our mandate, our first question is what credence do you think the ECB? could give to those other objectives, such as full employment. Another example is financial stability. So while the treaties do not contain a precise definition of what financial stability is, monetary policy decisions taken to maintain price stability can also impact on financial stability. So for example, over the past year, the monetary policy decisions taken by the ECB have helped to calm financial market stress Amid the COVID-19 crisis, they have eased borrowing conditions for governments and corporates. And this lowering of interest rates, it should help to promote price stability as those government and corporate entities can borrow at lower interest rates and will be more encouraged to make investments. With the low interest rate environment and other monetary policy instruments, they may also have effects on risk taking and prices in financial markets that can impact on financial stability. And Edward referred to these during our first session. The second question is, do you have views on the weight that could be given to financial stability, even if it is not the primary objective of monetary policy? And more generally, beyond the real economy and financial stability, are there any other objectives that you think the ECB should pursue? So one issue that is becoming increasingly debated, of course, is the important topic of climate change. This is also an area where ECB President Christine Lagarde has been quite vocal, as indeed have many other central bank policymakers. But there's still some uncertainty over the role that the ECB can or indeed should play on this front. So is it appropriate for central banks to target climate change policies? 
given that we are then making decisions uh, related to the allocation of public resources. But with this in mind, it could also be seen as a way of supporting EU policies since, as per the European Commission, by 2050, Europe aims to become the world's first climate neutral continent. So should the ECB actively support the actions of the EU to mitigate climate change through its policies? And if so, do you have any views on how central banks could help to act against climate change? So the second part of this session, um, we look at central bank communications. More importantly, um, we would like to know your opinions on how the ECB communicates its monetary policy strategy and decisions, how well you understand what has been communicated and how we might improve on this. So the ECB Governing Council, it meets every six to seven weeks to make its monetary policy decisions. When the monetary policy meeting has concluded, the ECB then issues a press release containing the details of those decisions, including the benchmark interest rate that will apply to refinancing operations conducted by the ECB in the current or in the coming period, along with other relevant monetary policy instruments. Then on the same day, shortly after that press release is issued, the ECB president and vice president host a press conference. At that press conference, which is live streamed, the president explains the monetary policy decisions and provides details of the economic assessment that has been made by the governing council informing these decisions. And on a quarterly basis, economic forecasts are also released as part of that press conference, which outline the governing council's expectations regarding the future path of inflation and output. And more generally, central bank communications have grown in importance in the conduct of monetary policy over recent years. It is important that this communication is transparent and that it is understood by those with whom the central bank communicates. And this must, of course, include the public. But successfully explaining to, engaging with, and educating the public is more than just a matter of removing jargon from our communication. We do need to be sure that we are transparent in our communication, but also that we are making use of the most effective channels that are available to communicate our policy to the public in a manner that is simple, well-defined, and clearly understood. The notion of credibility is crucial for the expectations channel of monetary policy to work. For while it is important that the ECB signals its expectations for prices and interest rates, the public must also believe those. And credibility requires that a central bank's objectives are clearly defined and that it is independent in pursuing those objectives. And therefore, expectations setting requires a central bank to clearly communicate both its objectives and how it intends to achieve them. And this requires, in turn, that the public understands the mission of central banks, that it recognizes the importance of that mission, and that it trusts in the commitment of central banks to deliver. And all of this requires effective central bank communication. So while the, the strategy review is obviously, it, it's a big undertaking by the ECB, it could ultimately change how central bank is implemented going forward. It will also be important to communicate the outcomes of this review to people when it is finished. So it is important to try to understand from you how we could best engage with you as representatives of the public. And we would like to get your views on how well you think the ECB communicates in monetary policy. One obvious example, I think, is the COVID-19 crisis. So how well informed do you feel about the stimulus measures that have been taken by the ECB in the wake of the pandemic? Maybe first of all, as these were first introduced around May or April, or March or April of last year, and even now close to a year later when these measures are still in place. And more broadly, we would like to hear your views on how the ECB could go about explaining the inflation target and the reasons behind that inflation target. And do you understand the risks associated with inflation being too high or too low? This was touched upon earlier, of course. We have the Benson Castle analogy, but we would like to know how communication with you of those risks could be improved. So how do we close the gap in communication with the broader public? Do you pay attention? Are you aware of the monetary policy decisions taken by the ECB Governing Council? In your opinion, what can we do to improve our communication? And at that, let me hand over to Ray, and we look forward uh, to hearing your views and your perspectives on these important issues. Thank you very much. That's great, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction to the session. 
Um, I have uh, some hands already uh, up in the air. So the first person I'm going to come to is Jared Brady, who's the chief economist at IBEC. Jared, can you hear us okay there? Perfect, great. Um, I, I suppose I talk about maybe three things, and this this is a, a broad area. It's a, it's a it's a it's a big bucket of different issues, right? But I suppose firstly to the to the review, it's been um, as was said at the outset, eighteen years since the ECB reviewed its its strategy, and and like that is pre digital. It might as well be Stone Age, I suppose, in a lot of respects, from a business and a society point of view. So so there are going to be massive challenges there. Um, in terms of reviewing its mandate. Uh, and one of the key questions in this session was about, uh, firstly, the role of, of the ECB, as we discussed in the last session, is about price stability, but there's also this piece about full employment and about other issues that, that monetary policy and, and monetary policy makers should care about. Uh, I suppose, looking at them one after another, uh, on full employment, I think businesses are, are keen from a consumer point of view and, and from, a, from a social stability point of view to support full employment in any way they can. The, the economic view, I suppose, of the economist in me says, uh, when we talked in the last session, uh, Gillian mentioned that the natural rate of interest is, is the lowest probably it's ever been when, when interest rates are low and falling and when, when um, the, the central banks are already doing a huge amount of work and, and particularly the ECB is doing a huge amount of work to support the economy. What's the, uh, what's the right balance between fiscal policy and monetary policy? Whether with the, the economic situation as it is and with, with low interest rates, should it be fiscal policy that is more uh, dominated by concerns about full employment than monetary policy? Um, so where's the balance between those two? And I, I think uh, our view is that, that probably fiscal policy needs to play a bigger role um, at, at a European level uh, and that the ECB is already playing a, a pretty adequate and, and, and good role in, in that respect. And then when you move on to other areas, as I said, 18 years is an awful long time. There's been so much change in that time since the last strategy. And, and I think in the business community, there's been a lot of change too in both attitudes and approaches. Uh, the probably the biggest change both here and globally we've seen is this move from pre-digital to, to, to digital in terms of the economy and, and from very tangible based businesses to, to intangible based businesses. Um, the, when we look back to when the last strategy was formed, the big businesses on the stock markets around the world were oil and gas companies, were large heavy manufacturing. Uh, and now it's, it's almost all uh, some kind of tech or financial services. So that switch from, from those heavy uh, oil driven in, in a lot of cases and, and, and energy driven companies through to digital and, and intangible driven companies has been enormous. And it's something that I suppose needs to be reflected um, in, the, in the new strategy. The other part of that is that I suppose when intangible assets and particularly people are far more important and, and skills far more important to companies now, there is um, a bigger concern about social sustainability, about attracting skills, about attracting talent, about uh, providing good places for people to work and live. So there is for both economic and, and social reasons, but, but for commercial reasons mostly, a greater concern in the business community about making sure that the other aims uh, along with price stability are, are heard. So things like, uh, environmental concerns, quality of life concerns, things like uh, macro prudential concerns that the, that the central bank has a role in and, and people's ability to, to live a decent life, I suppose, uh, and have good quality of life is, is super important because without that, you can't attract the skills which drive businesses and drive productivity growth. Um, so all of those now are, are, are big parts of it. Looking forward, particularly the environmental concerns and concerns about population aging are going to have have implications for for financial stability um, and are going to be big challenges for business as well um, and, and are both things that we think that the ECB should be should be looking at and and then finally I suppose this move to a more intangible world and probably accelerated by COVID has meant that there is a growing gap uh, we talk about inequality a lot when it comes to households but there is a growing gap between frontier companies companies that are highly intangible intensive that are growing very quickly, have high margins, and, and are and are dominating, I suppose, global commerce, 
in terms of their, their, their growth and importance. And a lot of laggards, particularly in the SME community, which are struggling, are facing higher costs and, and, are, and are coming up against big challenges. And I suppose the role of monetary policy there, when we're looking at things like growth and prices and inflation, um, when you have a big divergence between some companies who are doing very well, even in COVID, for example, and some companies doing very poorly is big. Uh, so, so there is a distributional challenge there that it's not just about aggregates, it's about the distributions too, and it's about different groups of companies and different groups of households doing very differently and, and something that the, that the ECB has to look at and probably is more of an issue now than it has been in the past. So th there's a lot there. I'd say on the comm side, very, very quickly, uh, from my own point of view, reading ECB press releases as someone who should understand what they mean, the, the plain language uh, and, and, and simple language would be a huge advantage and, and it isn't there with the ECB at the moment. So, so that would be that would be um, that would be a great uh, piece of progress if that was the case. Uh, and apart from that, I suppose most companies from a business point of view are consuming through the media the, the more uh, frank discussions we can have like this today directly with companies. Uh, the more we can get plain language and ECB communications, uh, the better companies will be able to understand. And it does have then an effect on the implementation of monetary policy in that it, it allows companies to understand forward guidance and to, and to plan better. Um, but that's all I have to say on that, Ray, but a, a big topic with lots more to, to be said, I'm sure. That's great, Jared. Thank you. Thanks very much for your input there. Again, um, encouraging anybody who wants to be part of this discussion to please uh, use the chat box at the bottom of the screen, uh, and we can bring you into uh, we can bring you into the session. Um, Mark, I might maybe come back to you if you had maybe some initial um, thoughts or responses uh, to what Jared has uh, has just said there. Yeah, certainly. And thanks very much, Jared. It is indeed a big topic, and um, you've really highlighted that. Um, a few takeaways I get from that. I'm not re responding, just takeaways. I think very clearly there are a lot of other other issues before, beyond what I outlined. And um, you include distributional issues, you include inequality, you include population aging, you include issues relating to well-being. And I think issues relating to well-being and how we measure um, economic welfare, societal welfare, um, are extremely important in the coming years, something we're very interested in in the Irish Central Bank and also in an EU context. You mentioned also the importance of structural changes that have occurred. It's 18 years, far too long since the last review. Some of the structural changes you mentioned, including in relation to intangibles, many other, they impact what we need to understand. How do they impact, first of all, on the transmission of monetary policy? Second, how have they changed the context in which we're operating monetary policy, particularly because productivity growth uh, has declined significantly and we're now at this much lower natural rate of interest, the lower bound. So all of those factors are key elements of the review and very much we'll be feeding back your thoughts on those. Very important also, you noted at the beginning, the interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy. This is a work stream and element that has been added to the review because of its particular importance and how I think fiscal policy is fair has stood up to its task a lot better than it did in the last crisis. Everyone acknowledges that, but it raises new questions about the interaction between the two and your point on communications, the need for clearer language, very definitely noted. We will feed that back for a second. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, again, if there's anybody who wants to come in on this discussion, please, um, I would encourage you to uh, put your hand up in the, in the chat functionality and we can bring you in. Um, just on the uh, the communications piece, it's obviously uh, something that's uh, dear to my heart, um, and uh, I would I would agree and reflect a lot of the comments that have uh, that have been raised there um, regarding some of the uh, the communications that have come out, um, and and how those transfer to the public. Um, I think I saw a hand raised there, but it may have uh, disappeared. Um, so again, if there's anybody else who wants to come in on this particular topic, um, I think uh, Edward Galicia, uh, I think you, yes, you've you've been brought in. If you if you wanted to make your comment, thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, on the topic of communication, um, I think um, it's uh, the steps taken in terms of communicating through the crisis have been really good. Uh, what what I'd regard as a success in in Europe recently is probably the 
maintaining unity among the, the, all the members through the Brexit negotiation. And that was due to extens extensive explanations to all governments and then flowing down into the press, into the, into the public. Um, so um, r rather than uh, rather than that be behind three closed doors. And, and I think that's becoming probably more important as, as, as um, Europe is challenged as, as an entity um, in different countries. Um, and I think so, so the need to explain uh, the mission, the tools, the strategy to all governments and all, 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 all the population across Europe is, is, becoming, is becoming more important to combat, um, to, to fight any, any of lack of faith because of lack of trust because of lack of transparency so i very welcome the, the efforts from the central bank on transparency and, and i think we should do more there that's great edward thank you um again if anybody wants to come in on this topic um could you please uh, put your hand up and we can bring you into the conversation i think bernard hughes i think is coming in so if we could just cue bernard if that's okay I, I just want to re-echo what Eduardo said there, and also it goes back to what Jared said previous to that. Um, uh, representing Castlebar Chamber of Commerce, I'll bring it down to grassroots level. Um, there's always been trust issues uh, when it comes to um, the bank and banking regulations and central bank, and particularly now uh, in light of Brexit, in light of the depression that we have uh, because of COVID, I think it's, it's great to have forums like this where things can be teased out and open lines of communication are, are transparent. Um, in, in terms of business going forward, moving away from smaller, uh, moving away from the larger business and just concentrating on grassroots business in and around Castle Bar, um, it's, it's a question of, of cash flow going forward. And the fact that so many businesses have been closed for so long, I think that's gonna be a, a huge factor in, in, in those businesses coming back on their feet. And also with the uncertainty of how consumers are actually going to spend, that their spending habits <clears throat> have been changed, uh, forcibly changed into trying to pursue what they want to buy online as opposed to walking into shops. There is a huge uncertainty there as to how they're going to come back and, and take up um, proper spending, walking through the door again in smaller business. I'm not worried about the multinationals or larger business. They're always going to be there. But I'm talking about the, the grassroots business who provide local employment. So I think it's a good start that we have um, trust uh, developed and, and forums like this will help that. But there is uncertainty that I think the central bank could probably give some direction on in, in terms of ensuring there is spending and cash flow uh, for the next six months of the year. That's, that's, just, that's my contribution. That's great, Bernard, and thanks for that intervention. Um, again, if anybody wants to come in, please raise a hand um, or use the chat functionality. Mark, I might maybe ask you to come in just on the on the last couple of interventions that you've heard there, um, and maybe to reflect some of those thoughts. Okay, thanks, Ray, and 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 thanks, Edward and Bernard. Certainly, we take the point on communications. Um, but Bernard's last couple of points there are really critical for the path of this economy going forward, and two big uncertainties. We know a lot of firms have been protected by government measures that have, have been in, put in place, critical government measures put in place, and by, I suppose, some of them are having existing holdings of cash. Um, but a time will come when the pressures that firms have been under for what is nearly a year now will begin to show, and how firms, how many firms um, survive or don't survive uh, will um, once the recovery starts, that's really when this will become evident. Once the recovery starts, we'll really see the damage that has been done to the non-financial sector. And um, that will be so important for employment and for businesses and, and really um, uh, um, critical for the path of the economy, as well as how consumers behave, which Bernard also mentions. There's a stock of savings accrued by some consumers. Many other households, um, by contrast, have suffered financial losses and how consumers will react after the crisis, those that do have savings, how will they spend that money? They might spend it on consumer goods, which will add to demand, but they may be imported goods, which do not add to domestic demand. It may go into the housing market, which may aggravate some existing problems within the housing market in terms of demand, supply imbalances. So these are, these are key uncertainties, and I'm very welcome um, to hear about them um, from Bernard. 
Thanks, Mark. So um, if there are no other questions or there are no other issues that anybody wants to raise, um, I'm giving you last chance so uh, you can raise your hand and we can bring you into the conversation. Um, and I'm not seeing anybody who wants to intervene. So I might wrap that session there and thank you all for um, Thank you all for your interest and thank you all for taking part in, in the conversation. Eddie. Thank you for your participation in, in the first half of the session as well. Um, so what I might do now is I might actually invite in Deputy Governor uh, Sharon Donnery to make some final remarks um, from what we've heard from the sessions today. Sharon, can you hear us there? Yeah, thanks. Hopefully uh, you can all hear and, and see me. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to take very long. I just want to echo again to say that we really appreciate um, all of your time and coming along uh, this morning. Um, I think for us, the real value in getting the on the ground experience of, of firms and uh, the representative bodies in terms of your understanding um, of the economic issues. I think one thing that always strikes me uh, when I talk to businesses and representative bodies and so on is that, you know, in the bank, we often think about the issues in the way that we've presented them to you today. You know, we, we talk about discrete aspects of the issues that we're responsible for, like the definition of inflation or how we measure inflation or climate change or uh, some of the other broader issues that Mark mentioned. Uh, but in fact, when we talk to you, you can really, I suppose, feel and see the interconnectedness uh, between all of those issues in terms of how they affect you and how they affect uh, your customers. And um, so I think we've taken away a lot of really good feedback. I think one of the key points for me um, is the need to continue to engage uh, with all of you on this issue, monetary policy, but on all of the other issues um, and the work that the bank is involved in as well. Um, but also, I think some very important messages about how we communicate and how we explain what we do and how that helps you um, understand what's going on in the economy, how it helps you understand um, expectations and how we explain ourselves um, in a very plain and clear way. And um, so I think that's probably one of the main messages I, I've taken away. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, we have tried to improve our engagement uh, with representative bodies, with businesses, with civic society um, over the last number of years. And we will have um, a number of other engagements with you um, over the coming years. We very much uh, look forward to that. And of course, you have our contact details and so on. Um, if issues occur um, in between time that you'd like to bring to our attention um, or you'd like to discuss with us. I'm sure uh, Ray can remind you of them um, as we wrap up, but really appreciate your time uh, for coming to talk to us uh, this morning and we look forward to talking to you again um, over the coming months. Thanks. That's great, Sharon. Thank you. So we will wrap this session um, now, if that uh, suits everybody. As Sharon mentioned, if there are any issues that you want to raise uh, post this session, you can feed back through um, IBEC and the chambers and the different representative groups uh, that are here, or you can come to us directly um, and our contact details will be shared um, and have been shared with you as, as part of the, the pre-briefing for this session. So again, thank you everybody for your attendance and your participation. We really appreciate it. and. Um, have a good day. Thank you.